Guillermo. Emil, I'm back to you. How are you? It's Monday. Monday, October 25th. This is show 165 of Emil and Muck's Takeout Live, because that's where we we're, we're just live on uh, what we call uh, our uh, micro talk show of the AAPI and the AAXs and the ALLs, if you're not an AAPI or an AAX. You're just an ALL and all. Welcome. Show 165 of the show we subtitled, What That? Uh, what does an Asian American think? We fill the void because you don't really know, do you? I mean, you think you do. Or you you want to say, oh, the assimilated Asian American, right? They're just all bunched in there. There's that, that lump in the, the census book. Is it a book? Is it? Yeah, it's that big lump along with the other... Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, all the AAs together. We just think that, oh, we know what they think. We don't care what they think. Hence, our show. The Micro Talk Show. It's micro. I mean, people talk about stuff on mainstream talk shows for like uh, three hours, four hours. And what do they say? They sell, mostly sell you stuff. I'm not going to sell you anything. It's going to talk about ideas. Today, we're going to talk about... Why October 25th is special? It's Larry Itliong's birthday. It's Larry Itliong Day in California. Larry who? Did he play forward for the Lakers? Or? No. Larry Itliong. This is Filipino American History Month. Uh, so we'll get into that. And why Filipino American labor leader Larry Itliong has more principles and fewer medals than General Colin Powell. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to put a bow on my Powell obsession. It's been a week now. And I've gotten some pushback for some of the things that I've said about Powell from friends, both on the left, who say, oh, you're too soft on the guy. And on the right, oh, you're too hard on the guy. And I'm just going to be me today talking about Colin Powell and just speaking of him as a black indigenous person of color, a first, a firster. Like I said, I don't sell you anything on this, but when people send me things, and of course you can send me things. I mean, first of all, you can watch us on Twitter. You know, you can watch this on Twitter, Adam Meal Amok. You know, you just go to Adam Meal Amok and you'll see my face and say, wow, there he is. Sh sh make sure you get show 165. You can see the replays on amok.com. But if you you know, send me something on Twitter or what, what not. A friend of mine, Christina Wong, is previewing her show tonight, Christina Wong, Sweatshop Overlord at the New York Theater Workshop. Now, I know Christina. She's a friend of mine. She's talented. She's funny. I've paid to see her several times. She's entertaining as heck. She also used to write for, um, what's his name? You know, uh, he does a show on CNN now. Before, when he had a comedy show, she was one of the writer performers on that. Talented. Talented woman, Christina Wong. Sweatshot Overlord. It is on at, uh, starting today. Get your tickets. Let's say if you use Auntie, the password Auntie, you get 20% off tickets. So just a little hint. New York Theater Workshop. Go online to the New York Theater Workshop and get your tickets tonight for Christina Wong, Sweatshop Overlord. I mean, she's interesting because Christina is a performer, but she's also an activist. And over or during the pandemic, she got her aunties together. She calls her squad, her aunties, to make face masks. And so it's uh, an interesting show. Christina Wong, Sweatshop Overlord at the uh, New York Theater Workshop in New York City. I am not in New York City. I'm in that 
godforsaken place known as California, where Chris, Christine is from. She lives in California regularly, but she's in New York now for the show. But I'm in the in in California where we we've, we've had so much rain. It's like it is not raining cats and dogs. It is raining a veritable animal kingdom. I think it stopped a little bit, but it was raining. And it was, uh, and if you saw that football game last night out of San Francisco, boy, the 49ers look terrible. Uh, this is a time for all the sports to to begin, right? They're, they're even playing hockey. And they'll be playing hockey throughout the summer. This is just the beginning. Oh, they're still playing hockey? There's a Yeah, they're starting now again. My big disappointment is the my Filipino American hope, who was drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs. Nick Robertson is didn't make the team. Got sent down to the Toronto Marlies in the AHL. Hey, I mean a few concussions and broken bones for players on the the Toronto Maple Leafs, and he'll be back up. Filipino American, Nick Robertson. Look for him. I, he's sort of like the the Phil, great Filipino hope in uh, hockey. But you got hockey going now. You got basketball to the very beginnings, right? Where, oh, who's going to be good? Are the Warriors really going to be that? Yeah, the Warriors are really going to be that good, I think. So, you know, Northern California Asian Americans are excited. And Southern California Asian Americans are saying, oh, God, the Lakers are bad. Don't tell me I got to root for the Clippers again. And the, and the Warriors beat both of them, the Lakers and the Clippers. So the NBA exciting the world series starts tomorrow and if you're a dodger fan i'm sad but you know i'm a giants fan so i'm not that sad i i am a little disturbed that the cheaters you know they say cheaters never prosper who's going to the world series the houston astros leave your trash can at the door i say houston astros i know they look good I like uh, Jose Altuve. I look at him. I I look him eye to eye and I say, Jose, where's the integrity in this team? I I don't know if I can like the Braves, though. Although the Braves, they put it to the Dodgers. You know, the Giants and the Dodgers played 19 times. And the Giants won 10 of 9 times against the Dodgers. The Braves, the Giants played the Braves only 3 times. And the Giants won two out of three times. So, you know, I, 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 I should have been rooting for the Dodgers, kind of, right? Because you know they because they beat the, the the Giants in the the NLDS. But I guess I was sort of rooting for the Braves because I wanted to see the Dodgers go down. And now I'm not really sure if I like the Braves, although they got that that pitcher who came out in the eighth inning the other day and struck out the side in the eighth and got people out in the ninth. Uh, he's so, so exciting. I forgot his name, but he's got an interesting pass. We'll talk about him tomorrow when the world series starts. And then of course we've got football. So we've got basketball, we got hockey, we got baseball, we got football all converging. So we can be monumentally distracted by everything at a time when we probably should start paying attention to things, you know, with the, um, the Biden infrastructure package looking like, Oh, it's on, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Climate change, all these things that are important. And then of course we have the coronavirus. So there's a lot of things to talk about. So I hope you, I hope your team won is, is my point. The 49ers look like crap. And so uh, I, uh, I don't know what's going to happen football-wise, but who knows what's going to happen. It's a long season. It's a long way to January. All right. So I said I was going to talk about why today, October 25th, is special. It's special because Larry Itleong's birthday. Who's Larry Itleong? Well, you know him as the guy who was overshadowed by Cesar Chavez. Everyone knows Cesar Chavez. Chavez, they name schools after, they name roads, they name parks. There's a national, a national uh, 
area down in sort of in the middle of central or south of, cent, of central California that is named for 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 Chavez. I visited it once. I was just driving along. I said, Here, "Here's where it is. I'm going to pull over." And it was quiet and it's serene, fitting for a man who believed in peace and love and. Hunger strikes, you know, a man cut from uh, the cloth of MLK and Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, right? I think that's one of the reasons why people overlooked It Leong and went straight to Chavez. They, they were like, Chavez had that mystique. It Leong was this rough around the edges, this guy who talked with... Uh, well, he had a Filipino accent, of course, which is not that bad. My father had a Filipino accent. He also had seven fingers because he worked in the, the canning trade. He was a migrant worker from the Philippines, came here in the 20s, worked in the fields in California, and then migrated up to Alaska, the, the canneries up there, the salmon canneries, lost three of his fingers, so he was known as Seven Finger Larry. But he had just enough fingers to hold that cigar, which he had, the omnipresent cigar. So he was rough and tumble, Larry Leon, a fighter. A guy, though, you'd want on your side. And here's the thing. People talk about the United Farm Workers and how they started with the grape strike in 1965. But who started the grape strike? It wasn't Cesar Chavez. It was Larry Itliong. Larry Itliong had been in the fields with the Filipinos in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. They'd been striking against growers and trying to get more money. Had affiliated with the AFL-CIO. Chavez just had a, a small little like community organization of workers. There weren't that many Mexican workers at the time. It wasn't a union, not like Itliong's Agricultural Workers of America, um, the AGWOC, they call it, the Agriculture Workers Committee. But they were trying to go to a buck 40 an hour. That's what their demand was in Delano, in the Central Valley of California in 1965. And they went on strike. The Filipinos did. Chavez was on the sidelines, said he would help. And then they both came to a realization. They needed each other. It Leong knew that most of the Filipinos had come in the 20s and 30s and 40s and they were getting old. And pretty much he also knew that he didn't want the next generation of Filipinos in the fields. He spared a lot of the young guys. And he would proudly say, look, you young guys, I want you guys to go to college. I want you to leave the fields. So It Leong, needing manpower for his strike, looked to Chavez. Chavez was on the sidelines doing nothing because he wasn't a striker. He wasn't that kind of an agitator. And a week after the strike, the Delano strike was put on by It Leong, Chavez joins. And that was the United Farm Worker movement, the merger of labor rights and civil rights in this country it's an incredible story when you see who who were the exploited people in america ag workers and who are the ones who begin to strike for their rights for equal pay for equal opportunity for housing for a working living wage at that time 1965 Something better than a buck forty an hour. It was Larry Etlion. It was the farm workers.
who were augmented by Cesar Chavez, and who then ultimately was somewhat at loggerheads with It Leong. It was kind of a personality thing. It Leong became a vice president to Chavez, who became kind of the, the head of the organization because most of the workers covered were, were Latino or for, or for Mexican Americans or Mexicans coming over the border for the first time. And here's the thing that really is not spoken about much. The Filipino workers had relationships with the Filipino labor contractors, many of whom were Filipinos. And they had relationships with the growers to provide workers, Filipinos, to the farms. And when the union came in, it pretty much cut out the Filipino labor contractors. And you'd go to the union hall and the people getting jobs weren't the Filipinos, but more often the Mexican workers. So that's a, one of the untold stories about some of the inner struggles of the UFW. But point is with Chavez, the, the head, people look to him, it Leong kind of faded or he left. He, you know, there, there were other Filipinos like Philip Veracruz stayed. He was a Filipino American. Pete Belasco stayed, but it Leong went on. He went on to do his own thing because man of principle, he wouldn't be compromised. If you go to my column on the ALDEF blog, aaldef.org slash blog, also another version of the column on the inquirer.net. Well, you know that it Leong would not be compromised. And I was fortunate enough to hear a a lecture that he gave in 1976. Mind you, it's about, what, 11 years after the grape strike. And It Leong was, was really one of the more powerful Filipino-American labor leaders because the union still wanted to have him work with Chavez because he knew that Chavez needed some of the the might and firepower that that Larry Leong had. And so he tells a story, and this was on tape, where Leong says that they wanted him. You know, many, uh, some of the unions offered to pay him money up to $200,000. And he saw that as selling out. He wouldn't do it. He said, I'm not taking your $200,000. The 350,000 Filipinos, that's less than a dollar a Filipino. He said, he said, uh, give me 50 million. That was his price. He couldn't be bought. Larry Atlanta. So we remember Larry as a man of integrity, a man who struggled, but a man who had the best interests of the farm workers, especially his older Filipino farm workers at heart. We remember him for being the Filipino American labor leader that he was on Filipino American National or Filipino American History Month. And we also remember how Larry was overlooked all these years, except really there was been, there's been a movement the last 10 years to shine a light on the man who really made the Delano grape strike happen and a man who really brings honor to a whole generation of Filipino Americans who came in 
the 20s and 30s and worked in the fields and were migrants working up and down California, going up to the canneries in Alaska. That was Larry Leong's life. A principled man. That's why we honor him. No medals, just principles. Now, it's funny because you consider Colin Powell all medals. Not as many principles. I mean, you say, well, wait a minute. He's had plenty of principles. I mean, I saw something today on social media. Maureen Dowd wrote a, a column yesterday in the New York Times about Powell's principles. And all 13 of his rules were I found on social me media. These were Colin Powell's rules. But you line up Colin Powell's rules, which were in his book, It Worked for Me in Life and Leadership by Colin Powell. And you line up these rules, and then you look at his life. I mean, when, when Colin Powell died last week, I was stunned. I just reacted as a human being in the moment. Colin Powell, Colin Powell, the general. I mean, he's a hero, American hero, right? Well, I was responding for October 2021. And even as I quickly went over his bio, the big deal was, what did he do in 2003? You know, oh yeah, I, I knee jerked it. I said he was a great man. But then, of course, I did mention 2003. What happened then? He spoke for the United Nations Security Council, essentially, to say that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. It was used to justify the Iraq war. He said he had intelligence. The U.S. intelligence agencies had information. But it was false. And he probably knew it. Later, Powell said, well... We went to war. Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Tens of thousands of Iraqis dead. We have the war in Afghanistan. You know, as an offshoot from that. How can you honor Colin Powell without really, really making him take responsibility for all that? Now, Subsequent, he he did say, "Look, that that that's a blot on on my history." He said, "I mentioned that, but I talked to some people, and they refused to accept that as enough to enough to forgive, enough to forget." I got some pushback from some friends and who are far more left than I am. And, and then we got into a discussion and then some guy said, what about me lie? I didn't even go back to, uh, what was it? 1968. And yet there were, were statements made by Powell when he was a major in the army. Did, did Powell, when he was given the letter from, you know, uh, given a letter from someone who was stationed, did he act? the Colin Powell Act. I mean, Charles Kaiser wrote in the Columbia Journalism Review that Powell, as a young major, was asked to investigate a soldier's letter that described the atrocities against the Vietnamese. And Powell rejected the charges and wrote, 
In direct refutation of this portrayal is the fact that relations between American soldiers and the Vietnamese people are excellent. Okay. And this was an example, of course, of how Powell was learning to play the game all too well. Where he found himself at the moral crossroads and he did not do the right thing. I mean, me lie, right? March 1968, dozens of members of the Army charged in the murder, but only one man was convicted, Lieutenant William Cowley, Jr., the platoon leader. And what happened? His life sentence turned into just three and a half years under house arrest. So there was a a lot of leniency against Asian faces, against people who did harm to Asian faces in 1968. So this is one of the things about Powell. And you look at the, the 13 rules of Powell, right? And it is bad as you think. It'll look better in the morning. Ah, that is number number one. Well, yeah, if you don't address it, if you don't think about it, you can forget the bad stuff you did. Number two, get mad, then get over it. Well, Powell was over it pretty quickly, it seems. Enough to keep rising in the military. Avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. Well, he left the army. He still was retired general. His ego did not go with it. As his position fell from man with medals and no principles to man with the uniform and just medals. Number four, it can be done. Well, he did. I guess George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld said, just do it, Secretary of State Powell. And uh, he did in 2003 before the UN Security Council. Be careful what you choose. You may get it. Well, poor kid from the Bronx, born to an immigrant Jamaican family, didn't do well in school, got C's and D's, but boy, love that ROTC. Four-star general. He got it. Don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision. Well, he said he had military intelligence that said, Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. Not a fact. But he stuck with his alternative facts. You can't make someone else's choices. You shouldn't let someone else make yours. Well, G.W. Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, I guess they made Powell's choices. Check the small things. Uh, WMD, not a small thing. In big letters, share credit. Funny. 2003, that UN Security Council speech. I don't see GW. I don't see Rumsfeld or I didn't see Rumsfeld or Cheney say, hey, we made him do it. They're not sharing the credit. Remain calm. Be kind. Well, I, that, that you must say. Well, his actions did end up killing tens of thousands of people. Have a vision. Be demanding. Uh, he had a vision that he was going to get out of the Bronx. He did. 
don't take counsel of your fears or naysayers. Well, he's gone now. But, you know, whenever anyone challenged him, he always brought up 2003, always brought up something. He stood, aside from the blot statements, it didn't sound like he was really contrite. And then the last principle of 13, this is three better than the Ten Commandments. Perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. Well, I guess he was optimistic to the end. But, I mean, as Maureen Dowd said yesterday in the New York Times, he, he should have read his own principles, his own 13 rules. And as I, I was writing the column on the Aldef blog and also on Inquirer.net this morning, I just thought, well, you know, no one knows Larry Etlion. And he had the principles and no medals. Everyone knows Colin Powell. And they just figure he earned his medals. Yeah, but what about the principles? Hey, I, I mentioned how in the end, look, I, I think from a, a BIPOC perspective, and that's how I appreciated him when I wrote the first column last week. You don't know what it's like when you're up there, the only black person in the room, the only person of color in the room, and you're asked to do some things, and what you realize is that it's a survival game up top. I mean, does it matter what you stand for if you're no longer standing? So you say what you must and maybe not what you should. Not if you're carrying someone else's water. And that's kind of how it happens for a generation. He was the first generation of BIPOCs who were given that opportunity to be the shiny hood on the Bush Cheney armored tank. And that's how blots are created along the way. I mean, some of us just think, oh, well, you know, there's some good things he did. You know, like, remember, we stood up for Obama in 2008. He was a Republican, a black Republican. This paradoxical move, this, was it revolutionary? No, wait, he just said, I, look, Obama's a guy, 2008. Then again, as a never Trumper, there was Powell leaving the Republican Party after January 6th, showing a little bit of courage and independence. I mean, it may not balance all the blots of an imperfect leader, but that's all part of the paradox, right? And, you know, after these last four years, all our, all the, the tools you, you use to measure leadership, all the leadership meters are all askew. What, what does leadership mean anymore in this kind of well, where we find ourselves in American democracy trying to deal with climate change, the pandemic social infrastructure so look I I, I wrote my column last week just being totally in the moment, October 2021 it informed the compassion I felt for Powell, the man, right now on the week he passed. And for that, I'm not ashamed. I mean, th this much we can say, though, about P Colin Powell. The man made mistakes, but he was not a mistake.
So that's my last word on Colin Powell. And let history be the judge. People will find out more, uncover more, and people will be able to dole out the responsibility, not just to Powell, but to everyone involved in that decision equally. A couple more uh, items today. Boy, you know, today there's so much history that happened on October 24th and 25th. For example, on October 24th, there was an anti Filipino riot in Exeter, California in 1929, which shows you the anti Asian sentiment when Filipinos were the top Asian American group in the country, about 30,000 Filipinos in the twenties came here and they faced, they were the Filipino flavor of the, of that era of the twenties. And then funny how October 24th, United Nations day, Filipino Carlos P. Romulo, the great, well, he's, Stayed in San Francisco for a long time. There's a street named for him in San Francisco. And now no one really knows Carlos Romulo. But in 1947, he was elected the first secretary general of the UN. Smart man, Carlos Romulo. I have to get into him. October 24th, that's what happened. But on a broader Asian American historical note, October 24th, 1871 was a Chinese massacre. 1871. I mean, there, I mean, you look through history, there were all the, all sorts of Chinese massacres. There was the Chinese massacre of 1877 in Northern California. The Chinese, Chinese massacre of 1871 was in Southern California in Los Angeles. There was a mob of about 500 white and Hispanic persons entered old Chinatown and attacked the Chinese there. There were two warring Tongs and then they were attacked. 19 people are dead. There was mass lynchings. Some were already dead, but some weren't. 1871, Los Angeles. And the, the funny thing was, is that all this, 1871, the, the Chinese came, the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, the gold rush, built a railroad, 71 in Los Angeles, they're settling down, and most of them come in as workers, just like the Filipinos in the 20s and 30s, subsequent to 1871, Right. And these bachelors were in Chinatown and because they were mostly men, there, were, there was gambling and prostitution and there was, and the Tongs, the warring Tongs that were ruling Chinatown were in charge of it all. And then there was a nasty rumor about a, a white rancher, a white cop, and how the Asians, the Chinese, were responsible for their deaths, and this mob of 500 comes down on old Chinatown in L.A. and begins, you know, wreaks havoc, massacres, slaughters, lynches, the Chinese Americans there in, uh, in Chinatown. You know, it's funny, I have heard more about the 1871 massacres in the last 10 months than I have my time writing 
an Asian American column in the ethnic media. Isn't that funny? So all this history, it's good to review it from time to time. Because you see that there's nothing new under the sun. Hate's been around a long time. If we don't learn from it, then these things repeat. And certainly repeated, 1871 in LA, 1877 in San Francisco, the Exclusion Act comes labor force, they get involved with this imperial sense. They go into the Philippines. They bring Filipinos over in 1905, 1904, and they become the labor force, and they get to relive the kind, because they're mostly, once again, bachelors, they begin to relive the kind of life that the Chinese bachelors did in 1871 and 1877. The 1920s, Filipinos turn. And then, as I mentioned earlier, October 24th, 1929, anti-Filipino riot in Exeter, California. So all this is not new when you consider the spa massacre in Atlanta earlier this year. And the wave of anti-Asian violence from as minute as saying, oh, look at that Asian woman with the aggressive Asian face to the most egregious physical harm and even murder. That's American history for you. AAPI history. So we've gone from Filipino American history to AAPI history. We've thrown in a little Colin Powell, talked about Vietnam. I think we'll call it a show. I'm Emil Gullion. We follow us on Twitter. Watch the whole show on Twitter at Emil Amok. Make sure you got show 165. Check out 164. I made a reference to guys saying here's a woman with an aggressive asian face that was something out of the mouth of uh, some shock jock types on the internet it's a transgression and it's real it's a form of hate and we need to talk about it or at least point it out and say we got to get this out of society, but this is where they come and hide and find refuge, the internet, except this show. This show is the antidote. Of course, this show is the antidote. Thank you for joining us. I'm here Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, live. It's a, uh, you can email me at a meal at a muck.com. This is the micro talk show of the API and the AEX and the ALLs. Meal Mucks take out. We're live. If you've made it this far, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for being this far, coming this far. Yeah. It was it was sad thinking about Larry Itleong. And there he was. You know, Larry, I, you know, this is Larry Itleong Day, October 25th. And he never gets much named for him, but he has his day now in California, and they named a resource center in Poplar, California, where Filipino Americans and Mexican Americans continue to live and work the fields. So they remember him in Poplar. We all need to remember Larry at Leon. Check out my column on the ALDEF site, aaldef.org slash blog. 
Thank you again for joining us. As I like to say, may you live in safety. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Till tomorrow. Bill Guillermo here. Mahal. Get